Hello. Most of us in this country cannot begin to understand how someone might murder a fellow human being simply on grounds of blasphemy. The idea that others might wish a killer well for upholding their prophet's honour is surely even more incomprehensible. But we know that in Pakistan, blasphemy has been an excuse for a killing, and there, crowds have turned out in support of a killer. But what about here? Well, Tanvir Ahmed was sentenced to life imprisonment today for the murder of Glaswegian shopkeeper Assad Shah. He said his victim, an Ahmadi Muslim, had disrespected the prophet. So how on earth did that perverse motive for murder arrive here? And is there any support for it? Secunda Kamani has been looking at the case of two murders, that tragic killing of Assad Shah in Glasgow and the murder that inspired it in Pakistan. These are the moments just before Tanvir Ahmed pulls out a knife and murders a Glasgow shopkeeper he accuses of committing blasphemy. His victim was Assad Shah, who had made YouTube videos claiming to be a prophet. Sentencing his killer, the judge today said he had shown no remorse. This was a brutal, barbaric and horrific crime resulting from intolerance and which led to the death of a wholly innocent man who openly expressed beliefs which differed from yours. This is the story of two murders. Tanvir Ahmed was inspired by another killer, Mumtaz Qadri, who five years ago shot a liberal Pakistani politician attempting to reform the country's blasphemy laws. <laughs> Mumtaz Qadri became a national hero of sorts. After his execution, thousands attended his funeral. Tanvir Ahmed had a handful of supporters in court today. However, no one in Britain has openly backed what he did. But we found a significant minority supportive of the killing in Pakistan that helped inspire it. Not just amongst those widely considered to be extremists, but amongst groups and scholars normally associated with more peaceful, spiritual interpretations of Islam. Masood Qadri, a scholar from Bolton, travelled to Pakistan to attend Mumtaz Qadri's funeral. He says Qadri was wrong to take the law into his own hands, but that he was provoked and should have been freed. He says he doesn't condone the killing in Glasgow. So you don't think it's fair to say that all these people in Britain who are supporting Mumtaz Qadri, like yourself, actually deep down are also supportive of Tanvir Ahmed, but they just don't want to get themselves locked up for inciting racial Look, hatred. Look, these are just the facts. There is no connection between these things. There is no connection between these things. Look, if we support this thing, and if we support these things, then we also write on this issue on Facebook. Masood completely condemns ISIS, but he and others see no contradiction between that and ISIS, but he and others see no contradiction between that in supporting Mumtaz Qadri. If we have homegrown terrorists, then we need homegrown leaders to combat and respond. For example, his Coventry scholar Zain Akhtab Siddiqui speaking at a conference condemning terrorism. And yet here he is on YouTube in support of Mumtaz Qadri. And Ghazi was a person of forthrightness and uh, uh, integrity. Here's a flyer for an anti-ISIS event held by a popular imam from Bradford. And here's his now deleted Facebook post describing Mumtaz Qadri as a lion. Qadri's victim was Pakistani politician Salman Taseer. We spoke to his son. To glorify a murderer is not to glorify the individual but to glorify his actions and to call on someone to emulate them. Now, this is not a benign or a passive emotion. It is a very active and provocative emotion. It is essentially a call to action. So when a man like Mumtaz Qadri is, is, is glorified, then sooner or later, a man like Tanvir Ahmad will commit murder. The issue of blasphemy is hugely emotive for Muslims. In Bradford, where Tanvir Ahmad lived, even some who totally condemn him believe blasphemy should be illegal. This country did have historically 
uh, law against blasphemy. Uh, those, 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 uh, those laws are now redundant. Perhaps the government should need to rethink and relook at that. Most people would find that pretty outrageous, really. The idea of having a blasphemy law in a free democratic well, what is society. A what is a blasphemy? Blasphemy is a uh, uh, right of, of a, uh, a faith community not to be not to be offended. Assad Shah is greatly missed in his local community. His murder is breathing new life into controversies many thought we'd left behind. Secunda Kamani there, well with us now from Glasgow is Hamza Yousaf, who is the first Muslim minister in the Scottish government and represents the neighbouring Glasgow seat to those where the uh, events took place. And a very good evening to you. Is it more than a kind of a tiny fringe uh, uh, who would regard blasphemy as a kind of a, a reasonable grounds for murder on occasion, do you think? No, I, th I think it is a minority, but that's not to say it isn't a serious problem. Even a minority of people having this view, having this sympathy, having those justifications, that is a really serious issue. And I think there is a little bit of uh, burying the head in the sand, uh, not just within the Muslim community, but perhaps even wider than that, that this problem does exist. Well, clearly Mumtaz Qadri has attracted a kind of a weird level of support, really, from people in Pakistan, outside Pakistan. Have you seen any evidence of that in the Muslim community in, in, in your part? I'm, I'm afraid I have. Uh, I remember when the terrible and tragic murder of uh, Saman Taseer, the Punjab governor at the time, took place. I remember there was people celebrating on Facebook, on social media. There was a shop in Glasgow, I remember, giving out sweets in celebration. I mean, utterly condemnable, uh, these actions. And to think that uh, that sympathy can't translate into violence, well, that would be, it would be wrong to, 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 not, to not make that link. I think there's a real job there to be done by the Muslim community, of course, uh, as well. I think we have to accept that there's a tiny, tiny minority, but a minority nonetheless that exists, that believes that uh, any acts of blasphemy or disrespecting the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is suddenly grounds or justification for violence. But there's also a job for others to do uh, as well on top of that, and working with the Muslim community. I just want to be clear, are, this, are these usual suspects, in your view, people who have pretty extreme views that are way, way outside the mainstream? Or is this something you've observed in people who you would not have ordinarily regarded as extremists, radicals, jihadists, or jihadist sympathisers? I'm afraid it's the latter. You know, I'm afraid it's, it's people that, uh, you know, I would, uh, if I go to, to my own mosque, that are unfortunately, again, a minority, and I have to keep stressing that, but yeah. not people who would automatically, in my eyes, uh, that I would think would be sympathetic to violent extremism. But uh, for one reason or another, uh, it has been drummed into them that uh, blasphemy, that disrespect of the Prophet Muhammad, who we're taught to revere as uh, closely as our own parents, that disrespect of that must be met with uh, any means necessary. Now, of course, that is completely contradictory to, to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad himself. He was somebody who was verbally abused, physically abused, and he only responded in kindness uh, to that. So those people who commit acts like Tanvir Ahmed did, well, they disrespect the name of, of Muhammad more than anybody else ever could. But there is a minority there, and, and no, they're not off the fringe in the terms that they're not extreme. They, these are people that in their everyday lives people would probably regard as, as fairly moderate. What is going on here? Why is this? Why is this such a touchstone issue for some people? Is it a, an identity thing, a projection of identity? Because it, it doesn't feel like it. It's not a West versus Muslim, you know, the, the great battle between these two global forces. It feels like it's a very strange, very strange thing here. I can only give you my, my interpretation. I'm no uh, religious expert, nor even an expert uh, necessarily in these matters, but uh, there's clearly a, a real subversion and a perversion of Islamic uh, ideology at the moment that's happening and, and taking place from, minor from a minority where they will read things in the literal black and white. Uh, they will divide the world into those who believe uh, the way they do, their extreme view, and anybody else that doesn't believe that uh, is frankly fair game. Uh, and what we have to do, and the challenge here for us as Muslim communities in the United Kingdom, is to make sure that we empower those that are the moderate voices, those that are real credible, grassroots, influential, moderate Muslims, make sure we give them a voice. What the danger would be, and we've seen this in some elements of the Prevent programme, particularly in, in south of the border, that often politicians will pluck people 
um, who sing the, the sing from the hymn, hymn sheet that the, the government want them to. They don't have any credibility within the Muslim community and therefore, frankly, are viewed from the Muslim community as suspicious. And, and therefore, uh, if anything, it hardens their views against them. So there's a, there's a job to do there. There's my, many, many, many more moderates, if I can use that term, and I don't often like to use it, but many, many more moderates, peaceful Muslims who are happy to tolerate and expect to be tolerated themselves, whatever people's faith, creed, religion or race is. Uh, but they're not the ones that are being empowered, unfortunately. And finally, you know, Tanvir Ahmed, he's given a life sentence for a brutal, brutal murder. Um, people in the court or out of the court who cheer or who pay respect to him, I mean, what literally should a government or the authorities do as you see that happening? Should we just say, look, it's a free country, if people want to cheer a murderer, that's, that's to be tolerated? Or is that something that is simply intolerable, do you think? I mean, it's something that's uh, clearly disgraceful and disgusting. I've got no doubt that you know security services will often look for patterns of what people, you know, ideology they claim to to, to associate themselves with, and whether or not that will lead to um, violent extremism, whether that's far right or whether that's uh, Islamic extremism or any other type of extremism that will be viewed. But that's a job for the security services and the authorities to do. Uh, but we do live in a democracy. We do live uh, in, 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 a, in a country where we believe in free speech. And therefore, as intolerable as people's views are, then, uh, you, know, you know, I don't think clamping down on people uh, necessarily for their views, uh, if anything, that probably would harden uh, the, the way they think. But I think there is a job for the authorities and the intelligence services to do. They do that already, but they work with the Muslim community up here in Scotland. Community policing is an integral Hamza. part of that. Hamza Youssef, thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much.